Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, like it always is, and uh, for about the next half hour, like always, I'm going to be rattling on about some things I think you should know about. If you have any comments, questions, reactions to the show, please, uh, you can email me directly. My personal email is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Survival a dark time you can get the email address from there or you can leave a comment there if you'd like um, if you do uh, email me by the way I always have the same two requests one please include something in the subject line that makes it clear this is not spam and two, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm really lousy about answering email but with that out of the way let's get to it I'm gonna start as I always like to with some good news um, and this week, I'm going to talk about the fact that the uh, the good news being that the movement known as Fight for 15 continues to expand. Uh, the effort for a living wage for uh, fast food workers, the notoriously underpaid fast food workers, actually started with a single rally in New York City in November of 2012. Since then, there have been nine days of coordinated one-day strikes to argue for a $15 living wage. And on April 15th came the largest one yet. Over 230 cities from coast to coast saw these coordinated one-day strikes. The movement, in fact, has grown enough that it's actually spread beyond the borders of the United States. Some McDonald's outlets in Greece, Canada, Brazil, and Hong Kong saw a protest of workers demanding better wages. There were also reports of strikes in um, Italy and New Zealand, it was. Now, perhaps even more signi significantly, though, the movement has also spread beyond the fast food restaurants to address the needs of low-paid, underpaid workers in other sectors of the economy where they are notoriously underpaid, areas such as health care, retail sales, home care, and child care. In the words of Kendall Fells, who's the organizing director for Fight for 15, which is uh, backed by the Service Employees International Union, the movement has become something different and, quoting, much more of an economic and racial justice movement than the fast food worker strikes of the past two years. Uh, now, while the company itself would undoubtedly deny any such connection, it pretty clearly was in response to the movement and the strength of it that McDonald's has announced an intention to raise the minimum wage it pays its workers uh, in, these, in the uh, uh, restaurants it operates, operates directly to $10 an hour by the end of 2016 and will actually pay its workers a dollar above the local minimum wage wherever they are as of July 1st. Uh, now, some critics have noted that this does not apply to McDonald's franchises, which make up 90% of McDonald's restaurants. Uh, and that's true, but it still means that the company is in fact bending. It is being forced by circumstances to respond to these demands. Which then actually relates this whole campaign to the whole issue of the minimum wage itself. Uh, it is widely, even wildly, popular among the general public to raise the minimum wage. Uh, and that degree of support is approaching a, a critical mass, not of, of opinion, but of active concern about the issue. As a result, some cities have already passed and others are considering a local minimum wage of $15 an hour, and a number of places have already raised their local minimums. Uh, and in fact, the majority of states now have a minimum wage for that state, which is above the pathetically low federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Again, clearly in response to these kind of developments, some retailers, uh, specifically Gap, Walmart, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and Target, now, this, uh, this retail sales, again, is another area which is notoriously populated with underpaid workers, but those retailers have promised to raise their bottom level wages to either $9 or $10 an hour. Now, again, some people have criticized that as being inadequate, which it is, but Again, it means that these corporations are, they are bending. They are being forced to recognize economic reality. Yes, they will do as little as they can get away with, but 
that doesn't change the fact that they, along with state and local governments, are being forced to move because millions of underpaid workers have gotten fed up and increasing numbers of them are willing to take to the streets to say so. And that is good news. Now, another bit of good news. This is something normally I would have included under our occasional feature called And Another Thing, where we deal with some cool science stuff. But this, I think, is important enough that I wanted to move it up front. Researchers at Duke University have made what is a potential breakthrough in the treatment of Alzheimer's, the disease of as yet unknown cause that undermines brain function. Neurons in your brain are cells that uh, process and transmit information. Uh, they do it through electrical and chemical signals, which in your brain, these signals are passed across the gap between the neurons. Now, what happens in Alzheimer's is that plaques build up along the nerve fibers and in the gaps, which um, inhibit the flow of information and so damage brain function. The result is that the cerebral cortex can atrophy and shrink and areas of the brain can actually fill with fluid instead of brain tissue. As you can see in this image, the, the, the scan of the brain further to the right, the one to, uh, to further away from me, your left, my right, that's a normal brain. The one closer to me is uh, a brain of an Alzheimer's patient and those dark blue areas, that's fluid, that's not brain tissue. Now, these Duke studies were done on mice, but on these mice with Alzheimer's with these plaques, the researchers noticed that in these mice, immune cells that normally protect the brain instead begin to consume a vital nutrient called arginine. Now, by blocking that process of consuming arginine, by blocking that with a drug uh, known by the abbreviated name of DFMO, the researchers were able to prevent the formation of those plaques uh, in the brain and actually stopped the loss of memory in the mice. Now, you can never guarantee that a process that works in mice will also work in humans, although the truth is that mice are often a good analog for human function. But even with that caveat, there are two reasons to celebrate this discovery. One is that it can break Alzheimer's research out of the box of focusing almost exclusively on amylid, which is the protein that forms those plaques. That focus has not, in 15 or 20 years, led to any marketable and thus massively profitable drugs. So, of course, the pharmaceutical corporations are losing interest in Alzheimer's research, despite the growing number of Alzheimer's sufferers. The other thing, the other reason to celebrate, is that DFMO is already being studied in drug trials for certain types of cancer treatment. Which means that instead of the 5, 10, or sometimes 15 years that would, that would be between a discovery like this and the beginning of human clinical trials, those trials may actually be able to begin quite soon. And that, again, is good news. All right, we've got a couple of updates for you about things we've talked about before. Uh, one is a little follow-up on the continuing fallout over Indiana's attempt to pass its version of, of what's called a RIFRA, RFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or what I think should properly be called a God Gave Me the Right to Be a Bigot Act. Uh, these are the bills that would allow religious belief as a defense against claims of discrimination against LGBT people. Now, you know, of course, as I've, because I've mentioned it before, that Indiana hastily amended its bill um, to say that it couldn't be used to justify violation of civil rights um, in the wake of a massive backlash against this bill. Now, admittedly, in some ways, that's not much of an improvement because there is no law in Indiana of uh, protecting against violating the civil rights of LGBT people. But still, the fact that the bill was changed so quickly showed the strength of the opposition. Some people, however, not only don't learn from their own mistakes, they don't learn from others' mistakes. Bobby Jindal, 
desperate to break out of the single digit support that he uh, enjoys under the with the mouth breathers who make up the bulk of the gopper primary voters. Uh, he's pushing the Louisiana legislature to adopt a God gave me the right to be a bigot law that's even worse than Indiana's. The one in Indiana provided a potential legal defense against a claim of discrimination against an LGBT person if the judge involved was convinced that this was done out of a sincere religious conviction. The Louisiana bill, on the other hand, would grant people who claimed a religious belief absolute protection against any government action. Meanwhile, on another front on this, the owner of a car sh a repair shop in Michigan announced on his Facebook page that he would not serve openly homosexual uh, customers because, you know, Christianity. Now, a lot of folks figured he was just trying to cash in uh, in the way that uh, Pizza Shop in Indiana wound up doing. The owner said they wouldn't serve, they wouldn't cater a same-sex wedding, uh, and a resulting GoFundMe campaign for the family raised over $800,000. Well, after the predict uh, predictable negative reaction to his bigoted rant, uh, this uh, owner of the car repair shop opened his own GoFundMe page, which raised a grand total of $5 before it was shut down for hate speech. By the way, this owner, one Brian Clowder, if I'm pronouncing it right, he said in his Facebook rant that, I'm quoting him here, homosexuality is wrong, period. If you want to argue this fact with me, then I will put your vehicle together with all bolts and no nuts, and you can just see how that works. Now, it's true that cars won't work very well with, with uh, just bolts, but apparently it's possible to run a business in Michigan with just nuts. Meanwhile, According to a new Bloomberg poll, 74% of those polled said that sexual orientation should be protected against discrimination the same way that race is protected. And 58% of those polled expect that same-sex marriage will be legal in all 50 states within 10 years. Now, note that latter figure has nothing to do with whether or not you approve of same-sex marriage. Uh, you, could, you could hold that same-sex couples should have the same right to marry as any other couple, but still feel that, oh, that's never going to happen in all 50 states. Um, or you could be opposed to same-sex marriage and still be going, eh, it's going to happen anyway. The point is both of those things point in the same direction. The culture wars on same-sex rights are over and the right wing has lost. The only question now is how long the dead enders will hold out. All right, another update. Last week, I raised the amazing possibility that I might, and I did strongly emphasize the word might, agree with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie on something after he proposed an income cap on receiving Social Security benefits. I did say I was wary both because this would turn Social Security into a partly means-tested program, something it had never been before, and because of the history of right-wing attempts to undermine Social Security. But I said that, okay, look, I'll look at the fleshed-out proposal. I'll at least consider the idea. Well, we now have Christie's fleshed-out proposal, and guess what? History wins again. Governor Krispy Kreme did indeed propose phasing out Social Security benefits for those making more than $80,000 a year in non-Social Security income with an absolute cap of $200,000 a year. He also proposed raising the retirement age, which is already going up to 67. He wants to raise the retirement age to 69 to raise the age for Medicare eligibility from 65 to 67, and to couple cost of living increases in Social Security benefits to what's called chained CPI. Now, that last part requires an explanation. Cost of living increases for Social Security have always been based on the Consumer Price Index, the CPI. It, it's the inflation rate. Uh, chain CPI calculates inflation in a different way, based on the premise that consumer choices and consumer actions change as prices change. 
It assumes in the most commonly used, for instance, that if the price of beef goes up too much, you as a consumer will switch to a cheaper cut of meat. Now on its face that doesn't seem a wildly unrealistic assumption, but here is the effect. Now bear in mind that this is a very very oversimplified example. I'm only using two commodities, beef and chicken, not a whole market basket of goods and services. But this is just for the purposes of illustration. Okay? But suppose the price of ground beef goes from $4 a pound to $5 a pound. Eh, it's getting a little pricey for you. So you switch to chicken, which has gone from $3.20 a pound to $4 a pound. Now the CPI says the inflation rate there is 25% because that's how much the cost of those commodities went up. However, chain CPI says, however, the price to you is still $4 a pound, so the inflation rate is zero. What this means is that at the end of the day, by its very nature, chain CPI will always produce a lower inflation rate than the traditional CPI. Um, so switching to chain CPI would be a stealth benefit cut for people on Social Security because while you'd still get a cost of living increase, it would always be smaller than it otherwise would have been. And that also means the effect would be cumulative. The longer you're on Social Security, which means generally the older you are, the bigger a difference between what you're getting and what you would have been getting becomes. It is a benefit cut, but it's one the politicos hope you won't notice. So Krispy Kreme's proposal is in sum, it would mean having to work longer to get Social Security benefits and getting less benefits when you finally do get them. Cut benefits, make it a mean-tested program, raise the retirement age, yeah, balance is restored. Chris Christie is an ass. We're taking a break. And here we are back. Uh, and a couple of footnotes to the talk about Social Security that I just uh, just did. Uh, one is that um, CPI and change CPI are not the only measures of inflation that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which produces the numbers, uh, they're not the only measures that they use. Another is called CPIE. The E stands for elderly. And it's intended to reflect the fact that, uh, that old folks tend to spend relatively less than younger folks on things like clothing, recreation, transportation, and food and such, but tend to spend relatively more than younger folks on things like housing and health care. So it's actually a better measure of the inflation as actually is experienced by the elderly. Which means, uh, which of course means for the most part, uh, people who are on Social Security. Uh, so it means that the, that the um, CPIE, the fact is, it usually shows a higher inflation rate than the regular CPI. That seniors actually experience a higher rate of inflation than the public as a whole. Uh, which in turn means that contrary to those who say we should cut cost of living allowances for seniors, the facts actually say that we have been shortchanging them for years. Now, which means that despite the, the ranting and raving of the reactionary budget hawks and their Democrat enablers, um, despite the claims that the old geezers actually have it too soft, We've actually, again, we have been shortchanging them for decades. Uh, the other footnote I wanted to mention here, and it's important to remember this always, that President Hopi Changi himself has on more than one occasion directly offered to approve two of Chris Christie's proposals to cut benefits uh, raising the Medicare re uh, re uh, eligibility age and switching to chain CPI. He has more than once offered to approve those cuts in Social Security benefits as part of nego budget negotiations with right-wingers in Congress. 
you got to remember, these people are not on your side. Unless you're of the elite, unless you're of the comfortable, they are not on your side because noblesse oblige is not the same as being on your side. All right, now move on to one of our regular weekly features. This is called the Outrage of the Week. And this week, it's sort of a triple outrage, something that could potentially have a major impact on your life. I've been meaning to talk about trade and trade agreements for some time and related issues to that, but um, it keeps getting put off because it always seemed in some ways too big an issue to be tackled in this space. There was too much to explain, too much background to go through, too many details to cover. Now, I don't know if that was actually a reflection of the complexity or size of the actual issue, or if it was a reflection of my ignorance or a reflection of my laziness. I, I, I don't know. But what I know now is that whatever the cause was, it cannot be allowed to stand in the way of pointing to the outrage. We are now faced with what Representative Keith Ellison accurately called the largest corporate power grab you have never heard of. It's based in two trade agreements. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP, that's with uh, between the U.S. and 11 Pacific and Asian nations, and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP, with the European Union. These these treaties, these agreements, have been and are being negotiated essentially in complete secrecy. And it would not surprise me if you have never heard of either one of them. Now, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, covers nearly 40% of the world's economy. And while a few summaries of some provisions have been released, the actual text remains under lock and key. Except for members of certain congressional committees, even members of Congress can only view the text of the agreement only in the trade representative's office without their own staff members or any other experts they want present. And they are not allowed to take copies of the agreement uh, back to Capitol Hill for any kind of independent evaluation. This actually went so far that one time the White House did a briefing, a congressional briefing on these agreements and declared that it was classified. In January, Senator, uh, uh, rather, Se Senator Bernie Sanders wrote to the U.S. Trade Representative, his name is Michael Froman, to slam the extreme secrecy involved in these negotiations. He got nowhere. The few parts that have been leaked of these agreements show first that little of this trade agreement has to do with, you know, trade. Uh, much more of it has to do with how corporations can use, use the agreement to undermine health, safety, and environmental laws and worker protections that those corporations claim have hurt or potentially they think could in the future hurt their profits while at the same time making it easier for those same corporations to offshore jobs and assert control over natural resources. Meanwhile, the TTIP, which if anything is even less well known than the TPP, concerns itself mostly with things like copyright protection that for one thing could prevent nations from making drugs generic, which would protect the profits of pharmaceutical companies while denying medicines to millions of people uh, in places like India who could no longer afford them. Uh, for another, this also would establish a description of intellectual property so narrow that it could potentially overrule fair use protections, giving corporations even more control over information than they have now. And if all that wasn't outrageous enough, the amazing Mr. O on so-called fast track authority, or Technically, it's called Trade Promotion Authority, a procedure under which Congress agrees that no amendments will be made to this bill when it's proposed, no changes at all. They can only give it an up or down vote, and that vote has to come within 90 days. No other bill, no other kind of agreement, no other treaty is subject to fast-track authority. It simply is an attempt to steamroller Congress into approving a massive trade agreement which, remember, most members of Congress will never have even seen until it is submitted to, for a vote. 
Or that's double outrage, now we're going to triple the outrage. The members of the Senate Finance Committee were given 12 hours notice of a hearing to approve fast track authority. Which means not only are these agreement supporters find, trying to fast track the agreements, they're trying to fast track fast track. We are being here played for suckers by a collection of fast-talking con artists among the corporations in Wall Street and their allies, foot soldiers, and sycophants in the Congress and the White House. There are still people opposed, including people in Congress, including some important people in Congress who are opposed to this. This is not a done deal, which is probably a large part of the reason for the haste in trying to get this through fast. But that doesn't change the fact that it's having gotten this far is an outrage. I'm sure there'll be more on this in the coming weeks. All right, last for this week, we're going to wrap up with our other regular weekly feature. It's the Clown Award, given as always for an act of meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to the state of South Carolina which filed what may be the most ridiculous brief yet among those submitted to the Supreme Court uh, in the attempt by some states to maintain their bigoted rejection of same-sex marriage. South Carolina argues that the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of the laws to every person, was not intended to have any effect on marriage laws. It left marriage laws untouched, quote-unquote, from their brief. All right, but in many states at the time, what those marriage laws included uh, was that women, married women, were not permitted to own property or to enter into contracts. They had no legal existence apart from their husbands. That was part of those states' marriage laws. What this means, according to South Carolina, according to what they say, the framers of the 14th Amendment explicitly preserved the rights of states to deprive a married woman of the ability to function independently of her husband. Therefore, their argument goes, if the 14th Amendment pr prohibits discrimination against married women, which South Carolina says it does, it of course provides no protection for uh, discrimination against same-sex couples. If we could discriminate against married women, of course we should be able to discriminate against same-sex couples who want to get wed. In fact, according to South Carolina, the 14th Amendment forbids only racial discrimination, leaving states to discriminate against anybody else, including women and LGBT people, any way they want. If the issue was not so serious and immediate, this would be funny. Instead, it is just creepy. The state of South Carolina. Clown. All right, that's it for this week. I'm um, going to wrap up a little bit early, I guess. Um, I look forward to being able to continue to do this. I look forward to uh, still being with you. I'm hoping that... Um, so I'm, I'm inviting again. I want to take a moment just to invite responses, good or bad. Although, you know, good ones. Gushing a few some praise is the most fun, but uh, not necessarily the most useful. But uh, if you have any responses... Feel free to contact me again at suviating at AOL.com. Um, in the meantime, we will see you next week. You have the best week you possibly can. Peace.